Well, I hope that you've been having a good summer. I feel like I've been away for a while, hadn't been that long. But we have had a little interlude this summer that's been primarily about missions. If you're here toward the latter part of the spring or early summer, I'm in this series entitled When the Church Fails. And I'm actually going to come back to that in August. And yet here in July, we've had a bit of a focus on missions. In essence, we might have been talking about when the church succeeds. If you've been here through this month, you'll recall that Lori Vaughn was here. And Lori used to work on the staff of this church, and now she's in the Middle East as a special teacher there. And then we had David Stevens, who is the president of the Christian Medical and Dental Association. And David has been around the world many times and just is a wealth of uh, really the glory of God and how he's working throughout the world. And I love to listen to that gentleman. And then if you were here last week, I spoke by way of video from Joplin, Missouri, uh, because I was with the high schoolers on their mission trip. And I was really thankful to have the opportunity to go there and to share with you, in essence, a bit of what God was doing in that setting. And I will say that I think we did some good things and helped some people there, but you know, most any time I've done any type of service or been on any type of mission trip and with the goal of helping somebody else, inevitably what happens? That there tends to be this great blessing that comes back to you. And that was true in a lot of ways. I think the greatest blessing to me was to see the Spirit of God alive and at work both in and through the young people of this church. We were there with uh, three other churches, a church from Wisconsin, one from New Mexico, and one from Texas. And it was rather clear that the young people from our church were just a fountain of the Spirit for these other young people. That uh, in many respects, they were discipling or mentoring these young people and what it means to have a personal relationship with Christ. Because I think some of these Young people from the other churches came from a background where all they had seen was a pretty much a religious approach to, to God that lacked intimacy. And to see what was going on among our kids had a big impact upon them. So I was thankful for the opportunity, and, and uh, you should be grateful for the young people of this church, what God is doing in and among them. And you might recall that at the start of the year, we said that there were four primary things that we were focusing upon this year. Men, which we really had a lot of emphasis upon earlier in the year and may again here later in the year. Marriage, we're starting a marriage mentoring ministry that's going to kick off a lot this fall. Millennials, most of that's going to come toward the end of the year. And missions. And so one of the reasons that we've had this emphasis upon missions here in the month of July is because it is, I think, important to us as a church. Do you know what one of the greatest dangers for us as a church is in the next year? To become inwardly focused and perhaps even prideful because of this construction thing that's going on. Because it, the goal is that it would be a place of ministry to help disciple people that our vision would be outward but whenever you do something like that there is a tendency to look inward the things that we need the focus that we need to have so I think it's important that we maintain an, an external focus as we go through this year because uh, some people when we had this discussion about building there was a discussion about well maybe we should send these resources somewhere else around the world my argument would be that they're not mutually exclusive, which means that you, that you don't have to do one and not do the other, but that you can do both simultaneously. That is, that you can do things to enhance our ability to build disciples here and at the same time have a greater external focus. And that's what I hope occurs for us as we move forward in this year. So now let me remind you of the teaching, really, as it occurred in the video last week. It was entitled, The Least of These, on the scripture from Matthew 25, where Jesus tells this story about that ultimately there will be this judgment where the, the sheep are separated from the goats. And there he will say, the king will say, come to those who are blessed because there's a great inheritance for them, and he'll give them the reasons why. He'll say, I was hungry, or I was thirsty, and I was a stranger, I was naked, whatever it might be, and you were the ones who took care of me. 
that you clothed me, you gave me food, you, you even visited me when I was in prison and things of this nature. You fed me when I was hungry. And it says here that the righteous will say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or when did we feed you? When did we do these things? And the answer that Christ made quite clear was this. He said, whatever you did for the least of these, my brother, brethren, that's King James, you did for me. And there is something very important there that all of us need to be reminded regularly that every day anything that we do for anybody else is an act, a potential act of love for that person and for Christ. Sometimes it comes in very small ways, sometimes in huge ways. But really, it's very significant that every day, without knowing it, without really being obvious in terms of how it takes place, that you and I are really having the opportunity to serve and love others, which simultaneously means loving Christ. And that's what he's saying here quite clearly. That when you see those who have needs those who are desperate spiritually or destitute physically, when you meet people's needs, you are serving and loving Christ. And really, I put that as the theme for last week because that in essence was what the young people of this church were doing. That in going to Joplin, the city that was devastated just a couple years back by a tornado, and, and they've largely rebuilt, but they're still doing things to develop that community and help them recover. And yet, you can physically rebuild but still have needs. And perhaps in some ways, what we were doing there was not so much meeting physical needs as spiritual needs. But all of us need to be reminded that you and I serve Christ when we serve others. Now this week, I want to continue to talk about this missions thing, and I entitled it a gospel globalization, essentially meaning that the gospel of Christ is not exclusive to one population. <coughs> Excuse me. That is, that the gospel of Christ is intended for the entire world. And so to explore that, let's look at this scripture here in Genesis. Notice that it says, and I was talking about Abraham, and it says that he will become great and power, a great and powerful nation, and all nations on the earth will be blessed through him. And the reason I pulled that out was to say that right at the very beginning, here in the book of Genesis, that God's statement was clear that he was speaking to all the nations. That he was bringing forth Abraham, and from him would come a seed, which would be, be the nation of Israel. And Israel was clearly God's chosen people, but were they chosen separate from or exclusive from the rest of the world? And the answer is no. That they were chosen to be a vessel to the rest of the world. Does that make sense? In other words, that God selected them out. In essence, he just selected one little family, which grew to be a very large family. And he said, through this family, I'm going to do something very special. I'm going to demonstrate things about truth, and I'm going to work in them in a special way. But I'm doing it so that they would be a blessing to all nations. So that from the very beginning, the intent of God was that he would bring forth truth to all nations. Now, one of the things that I am quite often reminded of when I think of the world itself is the fact that the scripture indicates that there is this general revelation of God that goes out to the world at all times. In other words, that God has, by the creation itself, revealed the fact that there is a creator. And it's not a matter that, <clears throat> that there is not enough evidence out there to indicate the handiwork of God. The only problem is that the hearts of men want to suppress that evidence. That we want, in our pride, to believe that there is something else. That we have greater authority, greater power, and so forth. And we tend to suppress what God has clearly revealed to all people. And it is the case to everyone in the world. For example, the scripture indicates that the moral law of God is written where? <clears throat> On our hearts. Now, it's not written just on the hearts of people in Tennessee, okay? 
It is written on the hearts of every person in the world. This is why there is this consistency of morality that you'll find throughout different cultures of the world. It is because the moral law of God, that which is right, is written on our hearts. And you see, that in and of itself is the evidence of God's hand speaking to the entire world. Now further, in uh, Matthew it says this. <clears throat> now this is the scripture we were looking at a few weeks ago in that series when we were talking about the fact that the church has the responsibility to make disciples. And that we tend to fail. We, we want to make converts. and We don't do such a great job in making disciples. But the part that I want to emphasize here is in this great commission. When Jesus was saying, go and make disciples, he said what? Make disciples of all nations. That there wasn't some limitation. He didn't say, go make disciples just of the Jews. Or just of a certain select group. Or the Europeans or whatever it might have been. He said, gave them this commission to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, do you realize that essentially every nation, if you tracked it back far enough, would just be back to a family or a conglomeration of families? That all of us have an ancestry. If we tracked it back, we'd go back through Europe or wherever it might be, and we'd find that we were just part of this little group that at one time was called a little nation or a little tribe in, in some part of that part of the world. And essentially when he says that to make disciples of all nations, it is not the nations as we think of them today, but it is all people. Everywhere, regardless of background or economic class or anything like that, the gospel is a gospel for every person. And so now I think it's important as a Christian that we have a mindset that is global. In other words, it is easy to get into a mindset that is just focused on our little world. Now, there's a word, some of you have probably heard of it, but most of you have not. The word is ethnocentrism. How many of you ever heard of that word? Ah, there are a few, more than I thought. Now, let me explain it. Ethnocentrism is this. The ethno part is like ethnic or culture. Okay, so the first part is about your culture, your personal ethnic group. And centrism is what? Central, or that, what is, that which is most important. So ethnocentrism is this. It is the idea that my culture is the best or superior. That I'm, because it is the center of my world. In essence, it's, it's thinking about the world from the standpoint of thinking that Whatever I know, my culture, my place of living is superior to the rest of the world. It's like if you grew up in California, you like California, you'd think California is the best place in the world to live. Or Michigan or wherever it might be. Now, you might be deceived in those thoughts unless, of course, you grew up in Tennessee in case it's true. right? <laughs> Just kidding. <clears throat> but do you understand? And now, do people tend to do this? Do people tend to be, have a problem with ethnocentricity? All of us do. All of us tend to think that our little world is better than the rest of the world. It, it's a natural thing. But it is a problem when you begin to think from the standpoint of Christ. What I mean by that? As you see, particularly, I think, in this country, we are very guilty of ethnocentrism. We think we are the greatest people in the history of the world, and that's because God has just poured out his blessings upon us because we deserve it. Well, in fact, none of us deserve it. Really, the blessings that have come upon this nation clearly have been because there have been broken and humble and contrite people who have sought the Lord generation after generation. And you and I are living upon those blessings, but in large measure, as a culture, we have deserted the heritage that our forefathers laid. And you see, but still yet, in this country, there is this problem of thinking that our culture, how we do things, is always superior to that of other people. But first, you need to understand this. All of us need to understand this. The problems of human life are the same throughout the world. 
that is the fundamental problems. What is my, where did I come from? What is my purpose here? What is my destiny? Those questions are before every person everywhere in the world. Now, in some parts of the world, people have bigger problems with, are they going to have enough food to eat tomorrow? And other kinds of physical problems. They might have more governmental problems or whatever it might be. But the, the problems of human life. Why am I here? And what is this thing about a God? And, and what about relationships with people? Those problems are the same throughout the world. And so the reality is that the gospel is truth that is applicable to every life regardless of where that person is. That the gospel of Christ is the hope, the only hope for humanity regardless of any place in this world. And that wherever the gospel penetrates, there is freedom and there is liberation and there is truth that penetrates the hearts of people. And so now... As a Christian, you and I are in the kingdom of God. When we started that series on when the church fails, we first defined the church. And the church is not a building or an organization. The church is made up of all believers throughout the world. Regardless of their culture, regardless of their, of their ethnic group, their racial background, whatever it is, there is one church. And you and I are not superior in any way to another part of the church that we are all a part of this one body. And I think it is extremely healthy for every Christian to think from a global perspective. That is, what is God doing throughout the world and how would he call me to participate? That it is not a healthy thing to just have my little sphere of the world and focus upon it and ignore the reality of the needs of humanity in the rest of the world. Now, <coughs> excuse me. In John 3.16, the scripture that most people would know who know Christ, it says, For God so loved the world. Now, do you think that means he loved the mountains and the deserts and the oceans? I don't think that's what it means. That he loved what? First and foremost, the people of the world, his creation, that he, he created humanity for the purpose of knowing us, for the joy of having relationship with us. And that his love is so perfect, so unconditional for humanity that he did what? That he gave his life that any person anywhere in the world may believe and have eternal life. Likewise, in Galatians it says this, that there is neither Jew nor Greek. Now another version would say neither Jew nor Gentile. And this statement to us may not be as significant, but written at the time that it occurred when Paul was writing, it was extraordinary because the Jews thought they were the superior people. If anybody had ethnocentrism, they did. The Pharisees were the leaders of it. And yet, for him to say in Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile, that there's no distinction that we are all the same, or even that statement about neither male nor female in that culture was a huge statement, was a clear statement about the fact that the gospel is a gospel for the entire world. Further, in Romans it says this, it's talking about the proclamation of Christ, or in other words, the, the mystery of the, of the gospel of Christ, that he is the one that is for salvation. And it goes on to say there that this gospel is so that all nations might believe and obey him. Now, I want to stop there and just ask you this. If you did an evaluation of your personal spiritual life, your walk with Christ, would you say that you have a relatively global perspective on the work of God? In other words, in your outlook on life, are you involved in some way or another in the work of Christ somewhere else in the world? Either 
supporting people, working with people. Maybe you've gone to other parts of the world. I mean, there's some people here in the church, like I know uh, there's some people here who've gone on medical missions almost every year to try to serve people in the other parts of the world from a medical standpoint. But, you know, I really believe that it is healthy for all of us to have a global perspective. Now, that's one of the reasons that we have allied as a church with Compassion International that we are formerly a Compassion Church. They're going to come here later this year. We're going to have a Compassion Weekend. And one of the primary reasons really is because I have a passion to encourage each of you to have a greater global perspective. And do you know what I think inhibits this global perspective for many Christians? If we are bluntly honest, it is the materialism that is in our own culture. In other words, that we are more focused on what we can acquire and increasing and enhancing our lifestyle than we are on meeting the needs of people in other parts of the world. And you see, one of the deceptions that can easily continue in life in this culture is that somehow or another that what we're doing here in our little materialistic progression is more important than meeting the needs of people in other parts of the world. Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, I could sell everything I have and give it all away, and what impact are you going to have on the world? Well, it would be statistically insignificant, right? However, if you had an impact upon one person... Is that important in the kingdom of God? When the compassion folks come, it's in late October, I think it is, early November. One of the people who will come with them is going, it will be a speaker who was a compassion child, who is now an adult. And this is somebody that somebody in the world took the time to give a little bit each month to support this child who was essentially living in poverty for X number of years. This person then grew to maturity and now is a productive adult member of the kingdom of God. And so whoever that individual was that supported them, maybe, maybe this person doesn't even know, that difference was huge in that one life. And there's, there's a multiplying effect because that person now is having an effect upon other lives. And I do, frankly, want to make you a little uncomfortable. You see, I, I do think that it is a healthy and wise thing for people in our culture to consider putting a ceiling on their lifestyle. Do you understand what I mean by that? That I come to a place where I say, enough is enough. I don't want more. You know, maybe you just got a big job promotion and your income increased substantially and you've been thinking about what could I buy. And perhaps you might need to think about how could I give that away. And I'm as serious as I can be that, that in this culture... I believe we are deceived about materialism to the extent that it robs us of the joy of being generous people. And there is a place for the Christian particularly to wisely choose to say, enough is enough. I want to have a greater global perspective. I want to impact the life of somebody else somewhere else in this world. For the kingdom of God. You see, in Mark it says this, that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel and whoever believes will be saved. Without any restriction, without any condition, whoever believes. And further, that scripture that I alluded to earlier, that's from last week, it says all the nations will be gathered before Christ and he will separate us out that every person will give an account for their lives. And essentially that account will start with, have you accepted Christ or not? And from there, it will be a discussion of rewards for how you have allowed God to work through you. And one of those ways 
is how have you impacted the rest of the world? How have you personally chosen to make a difference? Now, we have a guest who's really not a guest, but uh, someone that I want you to come, Mike, if you'll come, Martin. And uh, they're going to share with us a little bit about how God has worked in their lives. Um, This is Mike Sullivan. Some of you know Mike. Uh, he's actually been a missionary that uh, Celebration Church has supported for 11 years now. Is that correct? Yes. And um, you worked for how many years in Slovakia? 10 years. Is, is this Mike on? 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. The 10-year test. <laughs> uh, now, so as a church, we've been supporting Mike in ministry. He's with Josiah Venture. And... Uh, We've been working through him, essentially, to impact the rest of the world. you want to tell us about the type of work you were doing there? Sure. Um, Josiah Venture is in Central Eastern Europe. Um, it's 25 years ago, communism fell, um, and so we're working in those formerly communistic countries. Um, there are 32.5 million young people um, who don't know Christ. In fact, 1%—I'm oh, sorry, let's try it again. There are 32.5 million young people over there. 1% has a personal relationship with Christ. Um, and that 1% who do probably um, are first-generation Christians. And so our organization is working with the local churches to work with that 1% to reach the other 99%. So you were in a country for many years that had been communist. Correct. Right? Now, culturally, what was the religion like there even before communism or after? Now, this is Martin, his friend, who's from Slovakia. Okay. Right. So, um, well, the country, um, it, it, I think the effect it had on people, um, especially when I see my parents and older generation who actually lived in the, uh, during the communist regime, um, the the effects are are there and are visible, of course. Um, um, in Slovakia, about seventy or eighty percent of the population are Catholic, um, but they they don't have a relationship with Christ, and um, it's mostly tradition, and uh, so um, they don't have a concept of of, of uh, being saved through uh, by faith by faith, through grace. Um, for them, it's all about rules and um, keeping the rules. And um, so um, that's the kind of setting. And um, the younger generation um, is becoming more and more atheistic now. And so I think the, um, the it was communist regime before that um, affected um, the older generation, but now the, the younger generation is more affected by um, materialism. And so um, it's basically um, that. And, and um, so also um, my story was that um, I've never been to church or maybe a couple times growing up. And um, so... Uh, uh, Josiah Venture uh, was doing uh, English camps in Slovakia uh, at that time, and um, my older brother went to their first camp, and uh, he came back, and he introduced me to Mike. And so, um, yeah, we've known each other for about 11 years now. Um, but I understand initially you weren't too excited about Christianity. No, not at all, actually. Um, I was, it was just cool to meet the real American in, in Slovakia at that time. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and then I started hanging out with the youth group uh, in my hometown um, and uh, um, making friendships. And um, so, uh, but then I went to college and all these uh, relationships um, stopped and uh, the only people in my life um, who talked to me about God uh, were Mike and my brother, who meanwhile became a Christian um, thanks to their ministry in Slovakia. 
And your brother became a Christian through the ministry as well? Yes, okay. yes. Um, and it was his brother's prayer that he would become a believer and that his mom and dad would become a believer too. Now, how long did you two have a relationship before you came to know Christ? Uh, for about seven years. So it took that long? It took that long. It was a long process uh, with me in my case. Um, but um, he would... Um, talk to me and, uh, and text me all the time. Um, and he would actually come, because I moved to Prague um, to study uh, at a university. And so he would come to Prague, visit me in Czech Republic, and um, just talk to me about God and uh, give me books to read. And so it was, uh, it was a long process, but... Uh, now, about your ministry, I gather that a lot of it was building relationships mm -hmm. with young people. Yeah, we're all about relationships. Um, I, I believe um, we're all called to be missionaries, whether it's here in Tennessee or across the world. And I believe God calls us, like the scripture says, is to make disciples. And so we work with local church, like we worked with his brother, Yanni. I discipled him. Um, and the day uh, Macho or Martin called us, he said, I want to meet with you. His brother called me and goes, why do you think he wants to meet with us? And I said, I think it's time for you to share the gospel with him. And so he came to um, my flat condo uh, apartment, and uh, his brother shared the gospel with um, Macho. But I could tell Macho had a lot of fears, and, and I remember him saying, I don't want to become like you or my brother. And I go, what do you mean by that? And he said, I don't want to be in small groups, praying, going to church. And I said, well, your life will change, but I don't know what that life will look like, but it will change. And so... Immediately he went home, back to Prague, and God shared, he said, you need to go back one more weekend. And I'm like, I'll go to Prague anytime. It's a beautiful city, and I like hanging out with machos. So I went back that following week, and um, that, that weekend um, in a hotel room, he accepted Christ. So you want to tell us how that <laughs> You want to tell us how it did change your life? Yes, um, so as Mike said, I was afraid, you know, of being all, uh, you know, going to church and, and doing small groups and that. So um, after I accepted Christ, um, I actually, um, we started doing um, a small group in our dormitory uh, with some of my friends. Um, and um, uh, then I found a church in Prague and I'm now doing children's ministry, so, yeah. And um, also, me and my brother, um, we've been um, praying for our parents, and we've been talking to them uh, about, about Jesus, and so um, they started going to church, actually. Um, they're not there yet, but um, we're praying for them, and uh, we're hoping uh, one day, you know, we could all be one Christian home and Christian family. So. You want to tell us about how you saw life change through the ministry of Josiah Venture? Yeah. Um, this summer, actually last week, um, we just celebrated our 1,000th camp. We do English music and sports camps because our heart beat is for the young people. Um, Josiah Venture um, is named Josiah because King of Josiah was uh, eight years old when he became king. Um, I think he was 18, 16, 18 when he started pursuing Christ and then later, eight years later, um, led his people back to the Lord. So we really see movement taking place among the youth um, of Central Eastern Europe. And we've seen about 60,000 uh, 60, kids come through our camps the last 20 years and thousands of them um, have accepted the Lord. Now, in Macho's case, um, one thing communists did was um, ruin uh, the, the idea of what trust is. Like, um, for Macho, it took a while because of trust. Do I trust what you say? Do I trust what you do? I'm going to sit back and watch what you say and do. Um, and so it's, it's a process, and sometimes it's not. Um, there's, in all of our 13, 14 countries we're in, we're dealing with atheism, we're dealing with Muslim, we're dealing with Catholicism, um, and we're dealing with so many different things, and, but we're seeing that um, God is pursuing people like he was pursuing Macho, and he just used people like me who have a business degree, who basically quit his job, trusted the Lord to provide, 
and sent me over there to build relationships and to disciple these kids so that this first generation can then make more generations of Christ followers. Um, and it's been a huge blessing to, to really see Macho and his family and, and to see how they've grown and how he's um, sharing the gospel with other people um, that he comes from. Because now he works. Um, he's graduated from college. So it's fun to see him now support um, our JV nationals, or sometimes he supports me, which is kind of cool. Um, and so it's, 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 it's a blessing. Now, some of you may know, but in that part of the world, Catholicism and the Orthodox Church depending on which country you're in, are very dominant. And uh, actually, the Orthodox Church is the second largest segment of Christianity in the world, but most people in this part of the country don't know very much about it. But like you've probably heard of Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox or something of that nature, which is an offshoot from historical Christianity, from the Catholic Church. But yet, largely those are religious endeavors. A lot of people, like... I would meet with teenagers all the times, and we'd have Americans right now, they're over there doing English camps, and they'll meet with these students, and they're like, are you a Christian? And they'll say, yes, I'm a Christian. And then you're thinking to yourself as the American Christian, then why did I come all the way over this way to talk about God? So then you have to ask the second question, do you believe in God? Oh, no, no, I don't know if it's a he, she, or it. But you say you're a Christian. Well, yeah, because like Macho's case was, we go to Christmas, or we go Easter, or Grandma takes us to church. So that's where our foundation begins with we need to talk about who God is. And I did that with Macho. Um, don't ever recommend a book that you have never read. Uh, a missionary friend said, give him this book, The Case of a Creator. This guy loves puzzles, and he uh, read it within a couple weeks and basically gave me a long email dissertation going against what Lee had to say in the book. And I'm like, oh, no, our friendship is over. But God kept pursuing him and, and using me with him. And so I did read a book by Timothy Keller, um, The Reason for God. It's a great book for your friends who are skeptics because Macho was a skeptic. And a lot of the, the kids we deal with are skeptical. And so he read it, and that really helped. You know, I said that really earlier in my teaching that the same problems exist for humanity throughout the world. And one of those big problems is religion. That in our culture and other parts of the world, whatever the religious standard is, a lot of people buy into that because of cultural heritage or something like that. But it's a hindrance to a personal relationship with Christ. And you have to break through that, whether in Tennessee or in Slovakia. Any, any other things you'd like to share about how God worked through this ministry and affected you? Well, one more thing I wanted to mention is that sometimes... Um, you need to talk to people differently depending on where you are. Um, and, uh, but the gospel, gospel is the same everywhere you go. Um, so sometimes, like in, in uh, Slovakia and Czech Republic, um, people would have trust issues. And so you would have to really make um, honest friendships with them um, so that they would actually listen to you, what you're trying to um, talk to them uh, about and so um, first you need to make a friendship a real friendship before uh, you can actually share the gospel at the level that they would actually listen to you um, so uh, but but when you share the gospel it's, it's the same gospel everywhere you go you know so was there any key thought or uh, some realization revelation that you had that brought you to the place of wanting to accept wanting to know Christ um, yeah, I think it, it's not, for me, it wasn't one thing. It was um, several things coming together. Um, it was um, seeing people um, like Mike and my brother and having those friendships, um, then um, getting some answers um, um, in, in terms of uh, uh, just uh, like intellectual uh, things and um, and um, yeah and uh, and actually um, Mike suggested um, I I start reading the Bible, which was a that was a big help because I've never read the Bible before so so I was really surprised um, what I found there. What language so, were you reading it in? Uh, English. Oh, were you? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, anything else you'd like to share, Mike? No. Um, I would just ask if. Um, I want to first say thank you um, to Celebration Church for supporting me and continuing to support me. I currently live in Wheaton in our home office, 
trying to um, recruit and raise up more Ameri North Americans to come over to serve us in Eastern, Central Eastern Europe. Um, and I would just ask that you would please pray um, for Macho's family that they would accept the Lord. Um, pray for our, our, our ministry right now. We're, we're in the third week of English and music and sports camps. And I really want you to pray for the country of Ukraine. Um, we, had, we have several of our staff there. A lot of our North American teams were supposed to come over, but because of what's going on, they were afraid and didn't come. But we've had 15 college students come and serve this whole summer doing the role of all of these teams, and they're finishing up their last camp this week. So I would just ask that you'd pray um, for all of Central Eastern Europe. I know the hot spots are usually Haiti or South America, um, but like Robert said, it's all the nations, all the worlds, and there's all a need. We're not bringing baby Jesus in our pocket over to Central Eastern Europe. He is already there. It's our role to share, just to share a relationship with the students and share what the relationship we have with Jesus that we can share with them as well. So I would just ask that you pray for, for the ministry and pray for Macho's family. Well, thank you very much for sharing with us tonight. You know, as I say, the, the issues of humanity are the same throughout the world. And in the heart of every person is this desire to know that there is something beyond me. And there may be cultural barriers of different types, but Christ penetrates the hearts of people no matter what culture we are in. I'm reminded, as you were talking, it reminded me, many years ago I had a student, a young lady from Estonia. Estonia was one of the satellite countries that was a part of the Soviet Union. And she grew up as a little girl under communism. And of course, under strict uh, Soviet communism, you were taught to be an atheist. Atheism was clearly taught in schools. And she told me, she, now this young lady, when I knew her, she was a college student. She had a deep and rich faith, far beyond most American college students, quite frankly. But, but she told me that as a little girl, they kept talking about there is no God, there is no God. And it made her think there must be one that this, this suppression made her think there must be a reason they're saying that. And she came to know Christ as a young girl and just blossomed in her faith. But whatever cultural barriers there are, the Spirit of God still penetrates hearts with the truth. And so thank you for sharing with us and demonstrating that very clearly. I want to say essentially one last thing to you. I really want to challenge you individually, me as well, and us as a church as we progress through this year to have a greater global perspective. You know, if you could do one additional thing in your spiritual walk that would have an impact somewhere else in the world, you might make the difference in the life of a person, but I am sure God will do something different in your heart as a consequence. So I would encourage you just to pray that the Lord would reveal to you one specific way that you can expand the horizons of your Christian perspective to a greater part of the world. Well, let's pray. Lord, I do know that you work wonderfully in the hearts of people throughout the world. And I'm so blessed whenever I meet someone else in any other nation who knows you because there's this the reality of your presence in their lives. And it just connects the body of Christ in the church. And so, Lord, I pray that as individuals and as a collective church here, that we would have a greater compassion and passion to influence the rest of the world. That you would bring this about by the power of your spirit in each one of us. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.